Hi, and welcome to Enchantment of Eternity's review for Game of Thrones Season 6. So this video is where I give my overall review of Season 6 of Game of Thrones as a whole, so I will have to give this spoiler warning for Game of Thrones up to the end of Season 6. If you haven't seen all of Season 6, you may not want to watch this video, otherwise some things may be spoiled for you. So season six as a whole is a tough one to pin down. Before the season started, Dan and Dave told us that this would be the best season yet and that every episode would be a top-notch episode that moved the story forward and there would be no filler episodes. However, I learned from previous seasons to take the show's praise of the upcoming season with a grain of salt as they are often prone to high Hyperbole and make things out better than they are and indeed I find their statements about every episode being a powerhouse to not be the case and would say the season is more than other seasons was very backloaded where all of the really great really awesome stuff was reserved for the final two episodes of the season. I would say that the first two episodes are great. Episode 3 and 4 kind of dipped in quality a tad. Episode 5 was fantastic. Then episode 6, 7, and 8 felt more like setup and filler. And then episodes 9 and 10 were absolutely top-notch episodes. Amazing quality. Arguably the best that the show has ever produced. So on a whole, it does seem like the first eight episodes were mainly there to set up the last two episodes rather than it being consistently good throughout. I would say it's like watching a 10-hour movie if you uh, choose to binge watch the season, which I did on a second viewing, where the entire season seems to flow like one long movie. And if you look at it that way it's natural for the payoff to be at the end of the movie although arguably every season of Game of Thrones is like that I just think it holds even more true for this season as to the question of where I'd rank this in the six seasons, which I feel is best, I did a video before where I ranked seasons one through five in order from my least favorite to favorite as season three, season one, season five, season two, and then season four. And I remember uh, talking to my brother after episode eight aired saying that there was no way at this point that season six would be my number one favorite season, even if the last two episodes were the best episodes ever, which they were, uh, I couldn't consider it better than season four because season four was more consistently good throughout and I stand by that. But the question is, because the final two episodes were so amazing, is it enough for me to like it more than season two? And I think the answer is yes. I love season two and I think it's an underrated season, but it's definitely... Um, you know, a different beast than uh, season six as it's more consistently good throughout, whereas season six was very inconsistent. But at the end of the day, I think I have to give it the slight edge to season six because there were just more like great moments and great satisfying moments throughout the season. Um, and it just had such a great ending. And um, more than that, the season six ending was phenomenal. Definitely the best that the show has ever produced, which is saying a lot. So I do think I'll have to give the ever so slight edge to season six and say it ranks as my second favorite season, but it's a close call. And maybe I'll I'll change my mind about that later on. One thing is for certain though, season 6 by far had the best final two episodes of any season ever. So now let me go through each storyline, giving my opinion and breaking down each storyline and I'll do this in order from my least favorite storyline to my favorite storyline of season 6. So we'll start with my least favorite storyline of the season, which of course is Dorne. Uh, it did have the advantage of only appearing uh, briefly in just two episodes, so its total runtime is probably less than 10 minutes. But I'm still counting it as its own storyline anyway, and boy, uh, what we did see was even worse than season five. Uh, during most of the Dorn storyline uh, run uh, in season five, I was defending it, saying it wasn't as bad as people were saying that was until it went nowhere at the end of the season. And when I did my predictions for season six, I gave the show the benefit of the doubt and made predictions that would make Dorne good again but the show decided to go in the opposite direction uh, to that and in fact made it much 
worse. By taking a potentially rich and dynamic character played by a great and wonderful actor, uh, Prince Duran, and simply killed him off before uh, revealing there was more to him, and thus he remains a simply weak old fool. Uh, now I want to make it clear that it's not because it's different from the books that it bothers me. It's because it was horrible storytelling and a wasted opportunity. Uh, as big of a mess as uh, Season 5 Dorn's storyline was, there was still a way to salvage it, uh, but it wasn't. Um, you know, I would have much rather seen Dorn more this season if it meant that they could save the storyline by making the characters more dynamic and showing us why the Dorn storyline matters matters to the show, but instead they uh, simply show it as two-dimensional as we thought it was, and they try to just sweep it under the rug, which only makes the Season 5 storyline worse. And because we still have to deal with Dorn, I would rather they tried to fix it, even if it meant that we had to spend more time there. However, their appearance in the finale wasn't as bad because they didn't appear that much, and when they did, it was uh, Lady Orlena who told the Sand Snakes to shut up, which I'm sure was very pleasing for many fans. But we know now that Dorne has allied with Daenerys, so we will see more of them going forward. I would have preferred them to be, uh, you know, dynamic, interesting characters, and not these flimsy, poorly written, two-dimensional cardboard cutouts, which I never want to see again. So I still see Dorne as the show's biggest failure in its entire run. So next storyline I want to talk about is the Riverlands, which uh, actually consists of several storylines, which I just roll up into one, which includes uh, Jamie trying to recra reclaim River Run from the Blackfish, uh, the Hound becoming a new person and seeking revenge, and Arya getting her revenge on Walter Frey. Now, I would say this is my second uh, least favorite storyline of the season, particularly for the River Run Siege storyline, which I found quite boring. To be fair, I found this storyline equally as boring as the books, uh, and because they did little to change it in the show, I didn't think any better of it than the show. In fact, I was hoping that they would change a lot of it. I was hoping that there would be a big confrontation between Jamie and Brienne. Brienne uh, I was hoping the story would end uh, in a very different dynamic way with uh, changes that the shows has made. But no, it went down pretty much the same way where Jamie threatens Edmure into helping him who orders the Tully army to surrender and then the Blackfish just dies off screen. And Jamie waves to Bran as she parts. And the whole purpose of having Bran in the storyline seemed to be wasted. And she didn't really do much but fail. And, uh, you know, now uh, others may have liked the dynamic between her and Jamie, how they, you know, worried about being on opposite sides, sides, but showed that they still cared for one another. Like Brienne didn't ask Jamie to do anything that would compromise him, and Jamie let Brienne keep his sword. However, I wasn't really interested in that. I've never been a huge fan of the Jamie Brienne relationship, although I will admit it was cool uh, seeing Jamie put the phrase in their place. Uh, a lot of people um, comment about Bronn and how he was one of their favorite things about the storyline, but to me, he seemed completely superfluous. Uh, didn't seem like he was necessary at all and was just thrown in there for fan service and a bit of comic relief. But of course, the storyline's biggest saving grace was Arya uh, dealing out justice to Walder Frey. Uh, you know, it, that was just so awesome. And I had been waiting for this ever since the end of season three. And at last, we finally see it. And not only did Arya slit his throat and taunt him while he died, but she also fed two of his sons, Black Walder and Lothar, to him before doing so. It was just so awesome. And a great nod uh, to the Frey Pie storyline in the books as well as the rat cook story Bran told at the end of season three about what happens to people who betray guest rights like Walder Frey did at the Red Wedding. So that was very satisfying and also in the Riverlands uh, was the Hound storyline which is okay. It was kind of a stereotypical storyline that we've seen before in like Steven Seagal and other action movies where a violent man is taken in by a peaceful village and shown the error of his ways but then the peaceful people are killed by 
bad men, so the reformed man must go and seek his revenge. So nothing we haven't seen before. However, the fact that it was the Hound, and we learn that he's still alive, is what makes this storyline interesting. Plus, the character of Brother Ray was a really interesting, believable character played wonderfully by Ian McShane. And it was great to see uh, the new version of the Hound meet up with Beric and Darian and Thoros of Mirror of the Brotherhood without banners. But I'm still at a loss to what the storyline has to do with the whole story overall. Uh, no doubt we will learn more about this in the next season, but it was kind of unusual for the show to have a storyline focusing just on the Hound, as in the past he wasn't an important enough character to focus on alone without any other main characters present. So it will be interesting to see what effect this has on the storyline overall, but as it stands it wasn't an extraordinary storyline, but an acceptable one. Next storyline is The Reach. Uh, aka Samwell storyline. Now Sam and Gilly scenes are notorious for being incredibly boring however I historically tend to look on them more favorably than most because I actually really like the Sam and Gilly relationships. It's one of the few cute relationships in the show as you really feel for both characters as they've been through a lot and are ultimately pure at heart so you really root for them. But I will admit that the scene with them on the boat was one of the most most boring scenes of the entire season, uh, but their other scenes were quite good. Uh, they only appeared in three episodes, uh, mostly in episode six where they visited Sam's family. Um, these weren't among the best scenes in the season, but they worked really well for what they were, as the actor that played uh, Sam's dad was just so good, and he was just as despicable as one would suspect. And uh, I will say that the scene at the dinner table was a really good scene. It was interesting to see Sam cowered in front of his dad as he was still his one weakness is kryptonite however he overcame this in a sense as he rebelled against his father stole his family sword and it was very fairish Bueller of him to do so. However, I have a feeling uh, that his true test uh, is yet to come, and that's facing his father face to face. I was a bit surprised we only got one brief scene of him in Old Town in the finale, as I was expecting to see a lot more of Old Town this season, but it looks like they're preserving that mostly for season seven. Uh, it was a joyous scene uh, to see him uh, in this humongous library. It's like he died and gone to heaven, but all in all, the scene was mostly just set up, and so Sam's storyline was satisfactory, but nothing great. So next storyline on the list is the Iron Islands, and that you know also includes the, all the Theon and Yara scenes uh, in this storyline as well. So yeah, mainly this storyline. It was pretty interesting. I think it was a you know had a great start and a great ending. It was the middle that got a bit iffy. Uh, it was great seeing Balon getting thrown off a bridge as he was always an unreasonable asshole and wouldn't listen to reason from Yara, who could tell you know that his petty wars were a waste of time. But then he was just replaced by Euron, who I wouldn't say is worse, but a different shade of bad. It was also interesting seeing Theon return to the Iron Islands, which I still say was done more for plot convenience because they wanted Theon involved in the Iron Islands story around the line rather than the North Star line because they need to have a main character in the Iron Islands because Yara isn't quite important enough to have a storyline all on her own. Um, um, but I think it would have made more sense for Theon's character to go with Sansa and try to protect her, uh, for, you know, just for what he did, uh, to atone for what he did, which he obviously still feels really guilty about. Uh, his excuse was he didn't want to be forgiven, so instead he goes back to the family that pushed him into betraying, you know, doing the betrayals that he regrets in the first place. It doesn't really make much sense. But lucky for him, Balon's dead by the time he returns, and I really bought the way he and Yara bonded by Theon pledging to support her claim. It was quite touching, especially when he spoke up for her at the King's Moot. Now, the King's Moot was where things dip in quality a bit. It didn't start out too bad. Uh, it was definitely simplified a lot uh, from the books, but that's 
not the least bit surprising. Uh, it wasn't what bothered me. What bothered me was the way that Euron behaved, which was a bit mustache twirly villain for me. Uh, his line about, <laughs> where are my niece and nephew? Let's go murder them, was one of the cheesiest, worst delivered lines in the entire show. However, I'm not saying that the Iron Island storyline is as bad as Dorn. To me, it was just that one scene that felt a bit rushed and a bit cheesy, so that part of it reminded me a bit of Dorn. Other than that, I think Euron was fine, but definitely not as great as he was in the books and a bit more two-dimensional, but that's fine. Uh, when the focus came more on Yar and Theon uh, trying to beat Euron to make an alliance with Daenerys is when the storyline got good again because it was great seeing Yar tell Theon to either kill himself or get over it which is a very ironborn thing to do but at the same time you can tell she really cares for him so it's quite a great story especially seeing her pitch her alliance to Daenerys and she did a really good job at it. It seems like she knew all the right things to say and it was so great seeing those two strong women leaders finding common ground and being a queen in a man's world it was really good stuff so the next storyline is the Dothraki Sea. Uh, this storyline was fine, uh, but to be honest, it was uh, one of the storylines I was least looking forward to uh, before the season started. It introduced us to a lot of characters that either died or disappeared from the show. Uh, it went down very similar to what I'd expect, where Daenerys was treated like a prisoner even after they found out she was a, a widowed uh, Khaleesi, and they respected her, but still they were going to confine her to live the rest of her life uh, with the Dosh Kaleen, if she was lucky. Many people refer to the cows we meet in the storyline, like Cal Moro, as Discount Cal Drogo. I think that's a bit unfair, but I uh, can see where they're coming from. I hope we see uh, the young Khaleesi that Daenerys met and made friends with again. Otherwise, seems like a bit of waste of the time to introduce her in the first place. And I wasn't a fan of the Dario and Jorah adventures, as it was mostly just Dario and Jorah you know bickering about you know Daenerys which I found really boring uh, however it did get a bit interesting when they showed up at Vae's Dothrak to free Daenerys and of course the scene where Daenerys kills the cows by sir you know surviving the fire and becoming the leader of the Dothraki was awesome although I wouldn't call it one of my favorite Daenerys moments because to be honest there were no dragons involved and I'm actually more of a dragon fan than a Daenerys fan but it was a wise decision story-wise to have Daenerys be the one to get herself out of the situation all on her own without the aid of her dragons. It showed us that she was a true queen in her own right and not completely dependent on her dragons. So I do think it was a wise decision to do it the way that they did and I absolutely love the speech Daenerys gave to the Dothraki on Dragonback. Many people complained it felt unnecessary or repetitive because the Dothraki were already devoted to her at this point but I completely disagree. I thought it was completely necessary as even though the Dothraki were already devoted to her, they needed this extra kick to put, you know, get them all pumped up for going to Westeros. Plus it was confirming they were going to Westeros and I liked the callback to Cal Drogo's speech in season one. Plus it goes a long way seeing her on, dra you know, seeing her on uh, Dragonback as, you know, they're a culture of horse riders and to see her as a dragon rider, you know, a writer of such a magnificent beach would go a long way to getting them behind her. So while I found the storyline was a bit dull at times and a bit rushed at times, ultimately I thought it served the purpose it needed to for the overall story of the show and it did have some really awesome moments. Next storyline is the Bravo storyline. I know many people are going to disagree with me for having this so high on my list, but I don't care because I don't share many people's dislike of this storyline. While I do get the beginning of the storyline about the Waif beating the shit out of Arya all the time and Jack and insisting that she is you know, no one all the time, it was a bit repetitive as it did feel like we were just repeating the same beats of her Season 5 storyline, but I didn't think there were that 
bad and didn't really get behind all the complaining about them as I thought they were necessary evils to push her story along. Which I did think got really interesting once she uh, regained her sight and went on her mission to kill the actress. I actually really liked how this storyline played out because it was great character arc for Arya as she formed an attachment to the woman she was supposed to kill. And as many people pointed out, she had a sort of um, caring relationship with her, which is the kind of relationship that she hasn't had since her father died, as the majority of relationships were a tad bit adversarial. And I absolutely love the plays, uh, the alternate twist versions of the events of King's Landing, as it uh, was told uh, with you know a Lannister propaganda twist, which makes sense as they're the current ruling party of Westeros. It seems like a really great commentary about Shakespeare and how his plays like Richard III uh, twist events to favor the ruling family at the time and there are many parallels to be drawn between Tyrion and Richard III so I found that really fascinating and of course it was great seeing Arya's reaction to the play as she was forced to relive the events of her father's death and see the twisted versions of real life events and you could see through um, you know her advice to Lady Crane how she realizes that vengeance is all that she has to live for and uh, through these events she comes to realize that she doesn't want to just be a nameless assassin that she is in fact Arya Stark of Winterfell. Of course this realization comes at a price as the waif goes on a path to assassinate her for failing her task and um, yeah and this is where the storyline loses most people uh, while I agree it was really unrealistic how Arya survived the brutal stabbing and was able to run through the streets right afterwards. Uh, I didn't try uh, to make up elaborate theories to explain what was very obviously just poor writing and plot convenience and accepted it right away for what it was and therefore was able to enjoy the chase scene which I thought was very effective and had some very satisfying ending with Arya setting a trap for the waif and was able to use her blind training to her advantage. I absolutely love that. And that was the most, what was most satisfying to me was uh, Jack and Hagar's reaction, which I thought was totally and 100% in keeping with this character as established on the show. I personally still strongly believe that this was Jacken's plan all along from the beginning to train Arya to be a badass assassin so she could return to Westeros to get the revenge she wanted as uh, he even said so at the end of season two and this whole thing about her being no one was just a test as uh, was sending the waif to kill her which was a really brutal test to be sure uh, that he was hoping that Arya would pass so seeing the look of satisfaction on his face when Arya pronounced that she was Arya Star of Winterfell and was going home fit so perfectly and I absolutely love this scene. Now a lot of people had a lot of other complaints and nitpicks about this these scenes that I completely disagree with but I'll address that in another video. Uh, the one that could you know not possibly disagree with more is the complaint that her time in Bravos was a complete waste of time. I am completely flabbergasted that anyone could even suggest this, uh, especially after seeing episode 10, as now she's a badass, faceless assassin, a force to be reckoned with, where before she was just a whiny little girl with a lot of bluster and nothing to back it up with. Comparing Arya before and after Bravos is night and day, completely different so yeah the storyline was totally necessary and it was totally worth it and although it was a bit repetitive and dull at times the ending was amazing so the next storyline is the King's Landing storyline and uh, had it not been for the last several episodes this storyline would be towards the bottom of my list as throughout the first seven episodes uh, the King's Landing was by far my least favorite storyline as I found all the endless scenes of the High Sparrow talking about the gods to be really 
boring. But looking back on it as a whole, it makes total sense for an overall story and was built up to really nicely. However, I still don't think we needed as many scenes as we got with the High Sparrow talking to people about the gods, nor did they need to be as long as they were. And I also found uh, Jamie and the Tyrell confrontation with the High Sparrow a bit anticlimactic, but again, it served the overall purpose of the story as a whole. So even though I didn't like these scenes at the time, of these episodes came out looking back on it it served the overall story nicely uh, it was also interesting seeing Tommen slowly get corrupted by the High Sparrow as he's sort of the opposite extreme of Joffrey you know I used to like Tommen a lot because he was more kind and gentle than Joffrey but alas he's also too naive and easily manipulated uh, many people suggested that had Joffrey been king he would have simply just went in and killed all the sparrows and gotten stuff done done. Yeah, and he would have also gotten Marjorie and Loras killed and probably would have incited a uh, revolution to boot. However, uh, Tommen's way was just as bad as he allowed the High Sparrow to take over. Now, I loved Episode 8 storyline where Cersei got her long-awaited I Choose Violence line, which played out even better than I expected. I know many people were disappointed in this scene as they expected a lot more to it, but it played out pretty much as I expected, but better as I love Cersei's response to Lancel saying that uh, it wasn't a request, saying that yes, it is a request, and then seeing the mountain just rip off that sparrow's head was... <laughs> Oh, so satisfying. And many people were disappointed that Tommen called off the trial by combat, in part because it disproved the whole game bull at Cersei's trial by combat theory, which I was never, ever on board with in the first place. Uh, so it actually liked that seeing that theory disproved. But I loved it because it made so much sense that the High Sparrow would make this move and it, you know, would back Cersei into a corner. But of course, what really made the storyline great was the final episode when Cersei blew up Baylor's Sept. The scene was by far one of the best in the, in the entire series, and I loved the shit out of it. The music, the editing, the cinematography, the acting, everything was totally brilliant. It had a cinematic quality much superior to most films. It was absolutely amazing. And of course, the conclusion of seeing Cersei crown queen was so intriguing that the show actually got me to root for Cersei and being excited for a character I previously found so despicable and wanted to lose. It's a testament to how great this show is. So overall, the King's Landing storyline, much like season six overall, was very backloaded as it was mostly really boring throughout the season but got such an amazing ending with a payoff that just made it all totally worth it. So next storyline, and thus my third favorite storyline of the season, is the Marine storyline. Uh, in the first eight episodes, the storyline uh, had its great moments and it had its boring moments. I was kind of expecting uh, the season to show uh, Tyrion being a bit more brilliant than he actually was, as he seemed like he spent most of his time teaching a couple of squares how to relax. Although I didn't mind these scenes, as uh, you know, I liked the character development between them, and of course, you know, the um, scene where Tyrion released the dragons was simply amazing one of the great Tyrion scenes. But I, you know, it was a shame that Tyrion's ultimate play was to make peace with the slavers by offering a truce, but it did work for a time, but inevitably it backfired on him just as Grey Worm knew it was. Uh, but on the other hand, he did turn Marine from a poor hellhole to a lush and prospering city that mostly backed Daenerys by using tricks like getting the Red Priestess to support uh, Daenerys and encouraging uh, trade amongst the city. And he had a point that it was because he did such a good job with Marine is why the slavers had to resort to an external attack because they could no longer use the Sons of the Harpy. It also made perfect sense to me that the wise masters of the other cities were the ones behind the Sons of the Harpy, as it fit perfectly uh, to what has been established in previous seasons. Uh, I know that there were many people expecting the revelation of who the leader of the Sons of the 
Harpies was to be this great shocking moment as it would be established in an established character that we would have never suspected but I knew that wouldn't be the case and honestly I'm very glad that it wasn't as that would be a bit too tacky uh, and you know something you find in most like tacky TV shows and I think Game of Thrones personally is a of that sort of thing uh, and it simply made so much more sense uh, that it was uh, the slavers who were behind it and of course it was so great to see Varys back again in true form again uh, as he was up to his old tricks in order to find out who was behind the harpies and the scene where he manipulated the prostitute that worked for them to find out who was behind the harpies was so awesome to see Varys back in true form and like uh, the King's Landing storyline the last two episodes of Marine story storyline was completely amazing we got the best dragon scene to date in the entire series and i can't even articulate how satisfying it was to see daenerys and her troop uh put these arrogant slavers in their place finally and you know do it with some amazing dragon action was simply amazing every character had their own badass moment daenerys Tyrion, great war masande dario and it was one of the most satisfying get up and cheer moments in the entire series plus seeing uh, her name Tyrion, hand of the queen was a really touching scene and of course seeing her finally 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 make her way back to Westeros with her dragons, her Unsullied, her Dothraki, and her new Ironborn, Dornish, and Tyrell allies was so amazing and makes next April seem like decades away. So overall, it was amazing storyline. So next, and thus my second favorite storyline of the season, is uh, the North of the Wall storyline with Bran. As almost every scene was pure gold. Typically, Bran's storyline has always been my least favorite of every season, but that's mainly because it's all about him trying to get to the Three-Eyed Raven. It was so satisfying to finally see him there. And plus, the fact that he took season 5 off also made it more refreshing to see him again. Plus, the majority of his storyline was used to get us a lot of epic revelations from the past whether it be the revelation that it was the children of the forest that created the white walkers or how hodor uh, became who he was um, why he says hodor all the time to the truth about Jon snow's uh, parentage all of this was amazing to see including seeing ned and his siblings as children at winterfell and uh, to actually seeing the fight at the tower of joy and learning that ned had used what some would deem dishonorable tactics to kill one of the greatest swordsmen westeros has ever known and of course on top of all of these great revelations of the past we also get a great storyline in the present as the three-eyed raven rushes to train bran who just messes up by leading the night king right to them which leads to an epic white walker fight uh that was one of the most epic fight scenes in the entire series and of course uh the hodor's death was one of the most heartbreaking moments of the entire series and one of the most tragic seeing bran was responsible for messing with his mind in the first place which led to the events of him going on the journey with bran which led to him sacrificing himself to save bran sort of a closed loop which is just tragic but fascinating as hell and amazing storytelling and also after that uh when things look more bleak for bran and mirror we finally get the long-awaited question answered of whatever happened to uncle benjen uh when it is revealed that he is merged with a long-awaited beloved book character of cold hands of being an undead warrior that works for the three-eyed raven and the children of the forest and although his appearance was brief it was really satisfying and then we're left with bran discovering the truth of Jon snow's heritage so the question then becomes what does he do with this information what importance will this have for the story going forward so overall it was an amazing storyline and finally my favorite storyline of season six 
as the North, which includes all of Winterfell and Castle Black scenes. Uh, this was one of the storylines that was on point for every single scene. There wasn't a dull scene in the bunch, and uh, typically the storyline was the highlight of every episode. It starts uh, really exciting with Davos and a few other uh, Jon Snow supporters being cornered and threatened by Sir Alistair and the other mutineers who seize control of the Night's Watch, and it was so satisfying seeing the wildlings crash to the gates led by Dolores Ed who uh, you know, dishes out the revenge that the mutineers deserve. Meanwhile we get some other awesome scenes in Winterfell as Brienne finally redeems herself by saving Sansa from the Bolton men and finally gaining the status of being Sansa's sworn sword. It was such a satisfying turn to the story. And of course, just as everyone suspected, Melisandre brought Jon Snow back to life, which was so amazing how it played out, which made for some really uh, dramatic and great storytelling when Jon had to execute his own apprentice and seeing the effect that this has had on him was really heartbreaking but what really brought a tear to my eye was seeing Sansa and Jon uh, reunited. Uh, it's about time that we saw some Starks finally get reunited and it played out the way it played out was just so touching and realistic to their characters as they didn't actually know each other very well but having grown up in Winterfell uh, they had that in common and at that moment that was more important than anything else and of course uh, the flip side seeing the dark scenes with Ramsay of him murdering his father and having his infant brother ripped apart by hounds was just so brutal it brought a real great sense of foreboding to the storyline especially when he gets his hands on Rickon Stark and the pink letter scene where Sansa and Jon read the letter that Ramsay sent them was really foreboding and brought a great sense of urgency to the storyline that really raised the stakes in such an epic way and of course it only got better from there when we were introduced to one of the most badass characters in the entire series an 11 year old girl Liana Mormont it was just so awesome uh, I was acted so amazingly well as she totally put Sansa and Jon in their places and then became an invaluable ally. And all this leads to, leads to one of the most epic battles that the show has ever done, the Battle of Bastards that was pulled off so well absolutely cinematic really put you in the mind of Jon Snow as he was nearly defeated by you know falling into Ramsay's trap but was saved by some political moving, maneuvering by Sansa and some um, you know the most amazing battle sequences that ever seen on any screen but after all the horror and piles of dead bodies we get one of the most satisfying endings ever where Jon beats the ever loving piss out of Ramsay and then Sansa has his own hounds rip him to shreds definitely a satisfying death uh, that this character deserved and of course seeing the Stark banner flying above Winterfell again was equally as satisfying but all isn't well as Davos discovers what Melisandre did which leads to Jon to banish her and, you know, out of some sense of honor which may end up biting him in the ass and although they did win the Battle of Bastards they had to make a deal with Littlefinger to do so which is never a smart thing so now he's up lurking up there and seeing the whole King of the North scene play out with Jon Snow was truly amazing but again had a sense of foreboding as Jon Sansa seemed to have an uneasy alliance that Littlefinger wants to strain so it's you know sets up perfectly for next season so yeah all in all the storyline was on point at every turn and featured some of the best drama best action best suspense most satisfying and foreboding scenes of the entire season uh, making it my favorite storyline of season six so my rating for season six as a whole out of 10 is a 10 the best. Uh, this season wasn't always on point and did have its low points and some episodes that were mostly set up but judging the entire season as one long 10 hour movie it plays out perfectly as all the setup was paid off 
so amazingly well in what was by far the best ending to any series that this top-notch quality show has ever had. Uh, this season was also jam-packed with a lot of uh, amazing get up and cheer satisfying moments is going to make it really difficult for me to choose my favorite moments of the season because there were just so many of them uh, but this season by far had some of the best moments of the entire series making this a top-notch quality season so that's it for my overall review of season six be sure to check out my channel as i plan on doing videos for my favorite episodes of the season, my favorite characters of the season, my favorite and least favorite moments of the season. Also, I plan on reviewing my prediction of videos to gauge how well I did and what predictions I got right and wrong. I also do many more videos on other shows like Star Trek, Mr. Robot, Doc Matter, and more, so be sure to subscribe so you can keep up with all of that. And thanks a lot for watching. Oh,